Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Foote. I'm a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, and a physician scientist. I do clinical and laboratory research, mostly for colorectal cancer as well as appendiceal cancer. So it's, it's an honor to be here with you today. I thought the conference was amazing. There was a lot of really important high yield, high impact research that came out for our community, especially for colorectal cancer. And as a colorectal cancer oncologist, it was a big day for me. A few things that were the most uh, I think the most valuable, the biggest breakthroughs for me, we had several practice changing trials. The first trial I'd like to talk about is called the Breakwater Study. So the Breakwater Study looked at patients with BRAF mutant B600E mutations in the stage four setting. These are patients that unfortunately don't do very well. The disease is very aggressive. They progress more quickly on first line treatment. And we find that they have a higher instance of things like perineal metastases and multifocal uh, metastases that make it very difficult for us to be able to use resection, any types of local therapies to extend durable chemo-free intervals for them. So unfortunately, this is a group of patients that really needs innovation, that really needs new treatments. The breakwater trial was something we've been awaiting for a long time. It randomized patients to two main arms. There's a standard of care arm in the first line setting, which is basically full fear, full Fox, excuse me. And then the second, uh, second investigational treatment was full Fox plus BRAF targeted therapy and carafidib or cetuximab is what the BRAF targeted therapy was. And the results were very impressive. The study looked at a dual primary endpoint of progression-free survival, as well as overall response rate. Um, and they had a secondary endpoint of overall survival. So patients did really well on the investigational therapy of BRAF uh, inhibitors plus chemotherapy. When patients got full FOX plus BRAF therapy, the overall response rate was 61%. And this was compared to about 40% overall response rate in patients that just got chemotherapy alone in the first line setting. And this was a statistically significant difference. And it was very meaningful for these patients. Now, this was only one out of the two primary endpoints. So we're still awaiting the progression-free survival. So technically, the trial hasn't completed its two main objectives. However, when we looked at overall survival, it was also pretty important, pretty, pretty amazing. The 12-month overall survival for these patients was around 80% when they got BRAF inhibitors. When they only got standard of care chemotherapy, it was around 66%. So that's a difference of almost 15, 20% one year overall survival. And again, this is a very aggressive disease. So having 80% of people live a year is a big deal. Um, now, importantly, the overall survival wasn't yet statistically significant because they didn't have enough events. So they had a very, very long, uh, very, very small p-value they had to achieve at this point. But uh, we expect that it probably will be significant in the end. We're still watching it. For the patients that did have an overall response with BRAF therapy, the duration of that response was longer. It was about 14 months compared to 11 months in patients that just got standard of care treatment. So again, more patients responded when you added BRAF therapy to the first line chemotherapy and the responses lasted longer as well. So we sense they might be a little bit deeper. In terms of the toxicity of the study, um, it was relatively what we would expect. I mean, you're combining two different chemotherapy drugs plus two BRAF uh, associated drugs, one a BRAF inhibitor, one EGFR inhibitor. So the patients did have more toxicity, but it was pretty manageable. Most of the, most of the increased toxicity was in the form of cytopenias. Um, so I think the bang for the buck for patients is that this was a practice changing study. I think most of us are going to be using BRAF inhibitors in the front line with standard of care chemotherapy um, for this really awful disease. Now, looking forward into the future, one of the questions that a lot of people are thinking about is what about BRAF mutations that aren't V600E? How do we manage those folks in the first line setting? That's a, it's a good question. You know, there are other types of BRAF mutations that activate the BRAF protein that unfortunately aren't targetable with BRAF V600E treatments. Um, there's class two and class three variants of BRAF. Class two var variants require BRAF to dimerize, so it's not an activating the sense mutation. It actually requires a secondary signal. It's still activating, but the BRAF inhibitors don't work. So for those patients, I would not recommend using the standard of BRAF inhibitors in the front line. As everyone knows, those would not work. Class three um, mutations in BRAF impair the BRAF activity, um, but they can dimerize with another molecule in the MAP kinase pathway, such as RAF. So these are more like amplifiers of upstream activity. And in those patients, again, BRAF inhibitors wouldn't work, but sometimes you can use EGFR inhibitors. Um, the last thing I'll say about this study is that it's in a relatively rare population of patients. It's on only about 10% of people, but it's really important to check for BRAF mutations up front because, again, you need to get the next generation sequencing to be able to plan your first line of attack. And I think BRAF inhibitors are a really important, valuable tool in this space for first line therapy.